Okay, book of Colossians uh, for beginners. We're in chapter three. We're going to try to cover uh, just a few verses uh, today, verses 12 to 17, this particular passage. Uh, let's review where we are in this, uh, in this particular epistle. Uh, Paul, the apostle, in response to false teachers who are trying to uh, undermine Christ's position and teaching, uh, he demonstrates that Jesus' life and Jesus' ministry and Jesus' teachings place him at the right hand of God as a divine being. Uh, all of these things, his life, ministry, and teachings put him over all creation as the creator, uh, place him as the savior of all humanity, as the head of the church, as the victor over the demons in the underworld. We said that he had the preeminent position over all. Now from this primary or preeminent position flows the teachings which supersede any other teachings, especially those of the false teachers. The idea is if he's preeminent in everything, well, so, so is his teaching preeminent in everything. That's the point he makes. And the teachings of Jesus form the basis upon which we decide what is good and what is right, what is from God, what is not from God. So this is where we were uh, last week where Paul is explaining what kind of lifestyle therefore flows from this teaching of Christ and how is this uh, lifestyle rather superior to the lifestyle that is being imposed upon them through the teachings of the Judaizers. So in his explanation Paul says that those who have responded to Jesus' command of baptism They've cut away, so to speak, the old man of sin or the old standards by which they formerly lived. Uh, not just uh, low human standards of immorality and worldliness and lack of love, not cutting away just those things, but also the earthly standards of, quote, religion, built around laws on food and religious ritual and custom symbolized in circumcision. Now, he says, they live according to Christ's standard, which he conveys through his teachings. So in the passage we studied last week, Paul begins to describe the various elements of this new standard, this new living standard, if you wish, by which Christians live. And he said the first element of Christ's standard of living is personal holiness, personal holiness. And we talked about this last week, so I'm not going to go through each one of these things, but in his description of personal holiness, he said personal holiness means what? Well, it means as Christians we avoid sexual sins and sins of the tongue and lying and we pursue, actively pursue sexual purity and we pursue gracious speech and we pursue telling the truth and being truthful in all things. So the next section uh, contains several other elements that come together to establish the Christian standard. So in verses 12 to 17, he's going to describe several individual things that are trademarks of, Christian, uh, of the Christian attitude and conduct. Things that Christians see as part of the standard they strive for and they live by. So we go to verse 12a. He says, so, of course, you know, so, the so comma means if everything I've said to you up till now is, is true, okay, if Jesus is preeminent in all things and His teachings are preeminent in all things and His teachings direct us to live as a, a, a holy life, okay, so comma, as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, so first, however, Paul reminds them of who they really are in God's eyes as a way of encouraging them to continually strive for the standard that Christ has established. The Judaizers have made them feel inferior, incomplete, lacking what was necessary to be equal to themselves and thus worthy before God. You know, they were saying, you people are not good enough. You haven't done all the things. You need to be circumcised. You need to follow this law. We've got food laws. We've got all kinds of rules. You haven't followed those rules. You're not good enough. So Paul is answering that argument, that approach, saying, no, no, it's not that you're not good enough. You, you, you've been chosen of God. 
you're holy, you're beloved. Okay? So he refers to them with three terms that were originally applied to the Jewish nation in the Old Testament, but now are applied to the Christians at Colossae. A direct response, as I mentioned, to the false superiority claimed by the Judaizers. So let's break it down one by one. He says, you're the chosen of God. So the Jews, they were the people of God, the chosen ones, because they were descendants of Abraham, who had been chosen by God to establish a nation. We read about that in Genesis 12, 2. So we need to understand their chosen status was based on their relationship to Abraham. They were descendants of Abraham. Christians, however, were chosen of God because they were united to Jesus Christ by faith. And Christ had been chosen by God to save mankind and establish the church. So their chosen status was based on their relationship to Jesus Christ. So his point is, you know, the, between the lines here, he's always asking the question, so who here is superior and who here is inferior? You know, they, the Judaizers, they're claiming that they're chosen because they're related to Abraham. I mean, you're chosen because you're related to Christ. Who, who would you rather be related to here in terms of superiority? Next, he says, you're holy. The term means, of course, to separate. God had separated the Jews from the rest of the nations for a special purpose. They were to be the nation or the people through whom the Messiah would eventually come. Their religious practices, their history, their lifestyle, all given to them by God, made them stand apart from the other nation. You know, why did they have the Sabbath? What, what, point, what was the point? Well, as far as other nations, they were the only nation to have Sabbath. They were the only nation to have that feature. No other, no other uh, nation, no other religion had a, a, an entire day where they weren't supposed to work and they were just supposed to you know, have fellowship with their, quote, God. Only the Jews had that. That set them apart. Certain animals they didn't eat, that set them apart. In other words, they were not like the other nations. Why? Were they better, smarter? No. They were not like the other nations because of how God designed their lifestyle. That's why. So that's why sometimes it doesn't make sense to us today. Why, why can't you eat pork? Or why can't you do this? And, you know, why can't we eat lobster? You know? Christians, he said, are also to be separate. They were separated from the world by faith, separated from their sins by the blood of Christ, separated from death by the Holy Spirit. Christians were separated from the world in order to glorify God and to prepare the world for the return of Jesus Christ. That was their purpose. See, the Jews were desi designed, the Jews were uh, selected and prepared, uh, and their task was to prepare the world uh, for, for the first appearance of Christ. And Christians are here to prepare the world for the second appearance of Jesus Christ. He says they're also beloved. The Jews were beloved by God in that He sent them prophets and He gave them His word and He protected them and He promised them salvation. Christians are also beloved of God because they received the fulfillment of all the promises that God had made to the Jews. Who do you want to be? Do you want to be the people to whom promises were made but not yet fulfilled? Or do you want to be the people to whom all the promises are eventually fulfilled? Well, I'd rather be the ones that get to open the, the, the present. You know, I want to be the guy who opens the present and sees what's inside. I want to be that person, not just the person that sees the present under the tree, you know, if you understand what I'm saying. And so he continues in uh, chapter uh, uh, 12 to 14, he said, so put on a heart of compassion and kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. So next to personal holiness, Another distinguishing mark that sets the Christian apart is the loving attitude that he strives for, he or she, of course. No, I, I'll say another thing, no other religion has as its key doctrine the forgiveness and the love of enemies. 
a lot of religions have, you know, you should love the nature and the creation and your brother, you should love your brother, but there aren't, you try to find a key doctrine in any other religion that demands that its adherents love their enemies. No other religion portrays God as a God of love who demands love above all else. So love and the evidence of love within the individual and among the group is another basic element in the standard for Christian living established by Jesus through His teachings. I mean, what does He say in John 3, 16? For God so loved the world. And in John 13, 35, you know, Jesus said, this is how all men will know that you're my disciples, in the way that you love one another. Not that you wage war, not that you dominate the world, not that you surrender to all the rules. This is the way they'll know you're my disciple, the way that you love one another. So in these few verses, Paul will describe the kind of nuts and bolts of a loving attitude. In other words, what does Christian love, what does it look like? Actually, he gives the nuts and bolts first and then he summarizes at the end. So in verses 12 to 14, in the second part of the verse, he mentions seven attributes of a loving heart. Notice that he says to put on a heart, suggesting that these things do not come naturally. We have to make an act of the will. We have to make an effort to demonstrate this kind of love. That's why this kind of love, this is agape love. You know, in the, in, the, in, the, in the Greek language, they had many different words. You know, in English, we say, I love apple pie, I love my dog, I love my wife. Same word. Three very different things. In the Greek, they had more nuance. You know, you, there were words, uh, eros, for example. You know, that was uh, uh, sexual, emotional, passion type love, which is, of course has its place in human nature. Uh, there was another word, storjos, which uh, actually referred to family love, the kind of love that I have for my mom or you know, my dad or my favorite uncle. You know? I don't love my mom the same way I love my wife. That's why there's two different words and so on and so forth. So here, uh, in, in, he's not talking about eros, he's not talking about storjos, he's not talking about philios, brotherly love, you know, or, uh, what's the word, uh, philanthropic type love, right? I love orphans and so I work to help orphans. Well, the way I love orphans, not the way I love my wife, not the way I love my mom, you know, you know, it's a different kind of love. And then in the Bible, the word, the Greek word that they translate into the English word love, most of the times is the word agape. And agape means a kind of a sacrificial type love. A love that, is, 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 uh, that begins with an act of the will. So love your enemies is not eros your enemies, not being passionate about your enemies, not philios your enemies, you know, they're my friend. No, it's agape your enemies. Make a decision based on the command that I will love my enemies. I will do what it takes to show love towards my enemies, agape. So all of this here is the nuts and bolts of agape. How do you do that? So first he says, put on a heart of compassion, a tender feeling towards those who are suffering, who are in need. Kindness, he says, the same tender feeling but extended toward everyone, whether they are suffering or not. Humility, you know, pagans, they sought the upper hand. They sought power and domination. But love requires Christians to recognize their sinful state and realize that they're sinners among sinners. In other words, Christians, you know, they know who they are. They know that, uh, you know, they know <laughs> their weaknesses, if you wish. He says, meekness, not self-willed, desiring one's own way. Someone who's meek doesn't mean that they have no willpower, it just means that they don't always have to have their way. That's meekness. He talks about patience, the willingness to put up with suffering or trials or inconvenience, the willingness to do that without losing faith and love and joy and confidence. 
That's patience. Something's going to happen. Something happens that, that costs you a lot of money. You make a mistake. One of your kids does something. Whatever. The, the roof falls in or the contractor does a lousy job. You know, and oh my, the headache of having to fix his mistakes and so on and so forth. Patience is willing to put up with that kind of inconvenience and so on and so forth without losing the spirit of love and, 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 and kindness and you know what I'm saying? The confidence. That's patience. Long suffering, bearing with one another and the ability not to be provoked by another's weakness or insult. You know, in 1 Corinthians 13, love is not easily provoked, not quickly to anger. Long suffering is the ability not to fly off at the handle at every small problem. Forgiveness. Giving up the right to receive justice or restitution for a wrong done to you. That's forgiveness. No such thing as forgiving and forgetting. There's only forgiving because you never forget. Somebody does you a wrong that hurts you, you're not going to forget that. That's, going to be in, that's, that's printed in there. You can't, you can't forget it, but you can't forgive it. So Paul gives a little more detail here by describing a typical problem between two people. One person is upset with another and has a cause to complain. He says we should have the attitude with one another as Christ had with us. Don't continue to complain. Don't look for a judge or an arbitrator. Simply forgive and move on. Now I, I, you know, sometimes people you know, make the argument, well am I supposed to just forgive and you know, let anything go by, someone steals my dog or somebody breaks my window. You know. Remember, he says a complaint, someone has a complaint, not a crime. Christianity doesn't demand that we simply be victims. If someone commits a crime against me, I'm calling the police. If I see somebody going, you know, I see who it is that comes into my garage and steals my car and I know who that person is, he lives down the street, I'm calling the police and I'm going to say, yeah, it was you know, so and so. And will you go to a trial and, and uh, you know, present evidence? Yes. You know, as Christians, we're, we're not professional victims here. We're allowed to use the law to protect ourselves. We're not allowed to take the law into our own hands, however. But well, we can do that. And if someone sins against us, brothers, sisters against us, we have ways in the church to deal with you know, conflict, don't we? We go to the brother, we bring another brother, and so on and so forth. We have ways to deal with conflicts. We don't have to sit there and you know, suffer silently. But most of the time, especially in the church, they're not sins. And they're not crimes against us, they're usually just annoyances, aren't they? People are insensitive to our feelings or they talk too much or they, they may have shared some private thing that we may have shared with them with someone else. You know, they're like annoyances, we're, we're insulted, we're offended. This is what he's talking about here mainly. These are the things that separate friends and separate brothers in the church. I mean, people who don't talk to, people go to the same church, same congregation for years and don't talk to each other for years. And, and, and if you kind of you know, peel that onion and try to find out what's at the root of that, it's usually the most banal, simplistic thing. Well, you know, it was my birthday and you know, he wished uh, Joe happy birthday, but I was standing right there and it was my birthday, he didn't say a thing to me. You know, and I lent him my lawnmower once. You know, it's like, come on. So in the 14th verse, Paul summarizes these things by saying that love is the crowning glory of all. In other words, love is beyond these individual things because it is the fulfillment of all these things. Again, I refer to Paul, 1 Corinthians 13. Love is kind, love is patient, so on and so forth. So even though uh, these individual things bring Christians together, he says love serves as the glue that truly cements the relationships that Christians have. So he's talked about two elements that make up the Christian lifestyle. Holiness, that's one element that makes up the Christian lifestyle. A loving attitude, a second element that makes up 
a Christian lifestyle. A third element that he talks about here is a thankful heart. A thankful heart. Verse 15 to 17, he says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of Jesus, of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through Him to God the Father. And so personal holiness uh, is the standard of conduct in the world that we must have. A loving attitude is the standard of conduct that we must have in the church. And a thankful heart is the standard that we strive for with God, in our relationship with God. We can't impress God with our holiness because we're sinners. Our conduct is an attempt to put distance between ourselves and the world in the same way that the Jews may you know, put distance between themselves and the pagan nations by you know, the type of religion they had and what they wore and what they did and what they ate and their feasts and their festivals and so on and so forth. This distinguished them from the pagan nations. As a matter of fact, if you read in the Old Testament, God is always saying that not to do this as the nations around you. Don't do this because you'll be punished because this is why the nations around you are being punished. Why are they going in to take over the land in, in the land of Canaan? Doesn't he tell them uh, they're all going to be destroyed? Not because I like you better. They're being destroyed because this is their judgment that is coming upon them. And you know, he's using the Jewish people to exact his judgment. But the people in the land, he said, were sinners and they did detestable things and they did them for centuries. And now the judgment was, was coming. So, our personal holiness is the standard that we aspire to, to differentiate ourselves from the people in the world. Most of the times when our kids were growing up and they wanted to do things and go places, you know, that where there wasn't a specific black and white command in the Bible, you know how that is, teenagers, they know how to work their way around the rules. You know, my favorite fallback position, you know, where Paul is saying to Timothy, you know, uh, flee from every appearance of evil. <laughs> Well, Dad, you know, how, what do you mean that appearance of evil? If it's, e if it's evil if I say so. <laughs> it's evil if I say so. You, you cannot, at 16 years old, drive with a bunch of other teenagers all the way to Dallas for a concert and then drive home at, at five in the morning. Why can't we do that? There's nothing wrong. No. Flee every appearance of evil. Oh, Dad, that, no, no. Can my girlfriend, the boy, can my girlfriend sleep over? No. We're not going to do anything. No. Why? Flee every appearance of evil. We're a holy people. We, we, don't, you know, we don't do things like that. And a loving attitude, as I say, the standard of conduct in the church, how we treat each other. I know a lot of people that have said to me, I've been wounded more deeply by people in the church than people out in the world. And I, I believe that simply, why? Well, because we're, we're much more connected with people in the church most of the time than we are with people at the office. People in the church you know, have more ammunition with which to hurt us. And a thankful heart, you know, that's before God. You know, a loving attitude maintains unity in the church, but we can never outlove God or make up for His love with our own. You know, we can't be, we can't impress God with our holiness because we're sinners. We can't impress God with our love because He's the God of love. But a thankful heart, now that's something that is uniquely our own. It's something that we control and that we can legitimately offer to God in good conscience because it belongs to us. So Paul mentions three ways we can express and experience gratitude as Christians before God. First of all, thankfulness. A thankfulness for a peace of mind in verse 15. The word 
rule there refers to a judge or a, a referee or an arbitrator. The Christians were being judged by the Judaizers who wanted them to submit to their standard, you know, law, circumcision, so on and so forth, in order to be good enough. Paul tells them to allow the peace that Christ brings to their hearts, let that be the judge in deciding if God accepts them or not. In other words, let the peace that comes from knowing that Jesus' sacrifice washes away your sins, let that peace be the thing that decides if God loves you and accepts you or not. And he adds that everyone was called to experience this peace. And the sharing of this peace is the unique feature of those who are in the body of the church. Not circumcision, not food laws, not slavish submission to certain teachers. Those aren't the things that unite us. Those aren't the things that we have in common. What we have in common is all of us experience the peace that surpasses understanding. Why? Because our sins are forgiven. Because we have a sure hope of heaven. Whether we're young or old or male or female or tall or short or big or small, whatever it is. We, we share this peace that others don't. You know, that's, you, we, I've said this before, you know, the, the sign, we ought to put a sign up, says, sinners are welcome to the church of Christ. That's all we got here is sinners. Actually, all we have here are forgiven sinners. And forgiveness brings peace. So he says, be thankful that you have the peace of Christ in your heart and this peace, this is the assurance, this is the judge that you belong to God. How do I know that I belong to God? Because I have peace in my heart when I'm facing God in prayer. I'm not afraid. I'm not ashamed. Secondly, he says, uh, excuse me, I need to go back here. Secondly, he said, the worship of thankfulness in verse 16. A heart that is thankful ultimately expresses itself. And so Paul describes the natural progression from feeling to expression. The peaceful assurance in Christ should lead to expressions of thanksgiving. How should this be? Well, certainly not as the pagans celebrate. Pagans were notorious for having sexual immorality as part and parcel of their worships to the pagan gods. Some would even sacrifice their own children, so on and so forth. All kinds of detestable actions that they would do in, as part of their pagan rituals. And certainly, Paul says, not as the Judaizers express their feelings with empty rituals and self-abasement, can't do this, can't touch that, can't eat this, can't drink that. You know, that's not the way we do it. That's not, that's not the result of a thankful heart. He says, a thankful heart drinks in the words and the teachings of Christ and allows them to permeate their entire being. A thankful heart shares the peace, the message, the wisdom with others in teaching and encouragement. And a thankful heart praises using spiritual words and ideas provided by God just for such occasions. <clears throat> Excuse me. So if God is the one that sent Jesus to create the peace that Christians feel, then it's only natural that the praise and thanksgiving for this return to Him and to Him alone. I want you to note also in this verse that uh, in his only reference to public worship in this epistle here, Paul uses the word to sing, meaning sing without instrument, denoting the kind of praise that is acceptable before God. That's a whole other subject matter, but it's just interesting to see how he drops that word right in there. Okay, another sign of a thankful heart, a life motivated by thanksgiving. A heart that feels thankful will eventually begin to express thanks and this expression of thanksgiving will find its way into everyday life. The Christian lifestyle you know, is, is filled with actions, great and small. The difference is that the motivation for life is Christ and His service. Have you never had that experience? Have you never just been there driving and stopped at a red light and you look up, it's evening and the 
that beautiful Oklahoma sunset, the sky is just a flame with the sun, you know, and you look and you go, oh God, you're so wonderful. Thank, thank you for that. Thank you for that image. And then you know, the guy behind you, beep beep. Because <laughs> the guy behind you, all he's interested in, right? Green lights, time to go. I, I'm at A, I want to get to B. Well, you're interested in getting from A to B as well, but in between those things, there's a moment of rapture, a moment of beauty, a moment of worship, a moment of thanksgiving. Because for, just for a moment there, the reality that God is the creator of this, and here's the point, that He created all of this for us. I remember sitting there once, you know, some, you know, you, if you've been a Christian long enough and, and, and you, know, you're, you're, you pray on a regular basis, eventually you try to find new things to pray about, you know, take a different road instead of repeating the same thing. And one time I sat there and I tried, I couldn't do it, but as long as I could, I tried to list all of the things that actually give me pleasure that God has given to me. And the way I experience it is with pleasure, not just, you know, it's with pleasure. Uh, all the various smells, you know, the smell of good food cooking and so on and so forth. I mean, did God actually have to create that, that we would enjoy that sensation? It's very sensual, isn't it? This, this smell, perfume. Uh, the grass being, uh, grass, the most common thing, you know, being mowed and you drive by and the, you get a whiff of that freshly mowed grass and that, and that just smelling the freshly mowed grass sparks a memory that brings you back to your childhood and you remember something about your childhood and your brain is just filled with pleasure. And that's just from smelling some cut grass. And I kept going through all the, just the normal things of life, you know, mundane things that we do every day. How those things simply, you, 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 you're walking and then you sit and uh, oh, it's good to sit down, isn't it? You know, uh, the pleasure you get when your muscles relax and you get some support on your back because you've been walking around. I mean, every little thing that he's done gives us pleasure that we take in through our eyes, through our senses, through our taste, through our listening. You know, I mean, this is the God that we serve. Isn't it wonderful? Well, this is, this is the life motivated by thanksgiving. The Christian lifestyle, as I said, filled with actions, great and small. The difference is, that the motivation for life is Jesus Christ and His service, and that gives us the greatest pleasure of all. And so this motivation completes the cycle of thanksgiving that Paul is talking about here. We experience the peace of Christ in our hearts. We are moved to give thanks to God for this. We are motivated by gratitude to live and to serve in His name. I do what I do in the name of Christ because I am grateful. I remember, I remember I said to you, the, the only advantage of having been converted as an adult, I mean 30 year old adult, is that I can remember what it's like not being a Christian. I remember what that is like, being lost, not having a clue. And so uh, I think the Lord, has blessed me in the sense that I'll, I can never forget that lost feeling. And when I compare it to what I have now, it continually, it's like a fountain inside, it continually produces thanksgiving as a motivation to keep serving and to keep living faithfully. And so we experience the peace of Christ in our hearts. We're moved to give thanks to God for this. We're motivated by gratitude to live and to serve in His name. And this reinforces and deepens the peace we feel and it keeps the cycle turning. You cannot keep a Christian motivated by the law, by rules. God keeps us motivated, you know how? Through His goodness, 
through His kindness, through His grace. So we're not finished here with the elements of the Christian standard that Paul outlines. So far, however, he said that Christians live by Christ's standard, not the false standard promoted by the Judaizers. He says this Christian standard has several elements. The ones that Paul has described so far, the element of personal holiness, the element of a loving attitude, the element of a thankful heart. And so next time we're going to look at the final two elements of the Christian standard for living described by Paul in this particular epistle as we kind of wind it down. We're getting close to the end of the epistle and the end of the series. Okay, thank you very much. That'll be our lesson for this morning.